I don't want to grow up, I'm a curious kid The world has a hundred questions I can play with So I'll open my arms and eyes And wonder every day till the day I die Good evening and welcome to Bookshop West Portal. My name is Susan Tunis. I never even got to put lipstick on tonight, but I want to thank you guys for being already um, one of the best audiences we've ever had. One of the biggest, one of the best looking, one of the nicest audiences we've ever had. I am so delighted to welcome our guests this evening. For starters, we have from Yale University, Dr. John Barge, who it's such an honor to have here. And for second, we have Wonderfest in the house. And the reason that excites me is that I have been attending Wonderfest lectures for 15 years. I am an honest to God Wonderfest groupie. I'm a Tucker Hyatt groupie. Uh, and, um, and, you know, I do events for this bookstore. And a while ago, I was like, Tucker? I know it's not the ideal setting for Wonderfest events, but you haven't been having that many events in San Francisco. Can we make it work? Um, I hope that we can. I really appreciate you guys coming out here. I am going to hand off to uh, Mariel Godou, who is one of Wonderfest Science Envoys, to introduce Dr. John Barge. Thank you. Thank you so much, and um, and thank you to the bookshop for having us here tonight. Um, so my name is Mariel Gadu. I am a Wonderfest Science Envoy and a PhD student in the Department of Psychology at UC Berkeley. Um, and it is my pleasure this evening to introduce Dr. John Barge. Um, Dr. Barge is a professor of psychology and cognitive science at Yale University, where he directs the Automaticity in Cognition, Motivation, and Emotion Lab. Um, Dr. Barge received his PhD in social psychology from the University of Michigan in 1981, uh, then joined the faculty of NYU and arrived at Yale in 2003. His pioneering work has won broad recognition, uh, including a research prize from the Max Planck Society uh, and a Guggenheim Fellowship, to name just a few. Um, Dr. Barge's work investigates uh, the mystery of the unconscious mechanisms that undergird our thoughts and behavior. Um, so from the moment you stepped in the door tonight to the time you took your seat, uh, you made a number of decisions, uh, like where to sit, perhaps. You made some observations, uh, like who all is here and what it's like. Um, and you have some emotions about what it's like to be here. And while a lot of people, um, a lot of psychologists even, might be pretty happy to say things like, you decided where to sit. You think everyone here looks pretty cool. Uh, you know that you're having an amazing time, despite some audiovisual difficulties. Um, Dr. Barge might say, uh, not so fast. Because on Dr. Barge's uh, detailed, dynamic view of human psychology, our cognition, um, our thinking, and whatever else sort of registers for us as conscious experience, is constantly and unavoidably shaped by our context, our environment. Um, and if we acknowledge that our apparent decisions, motivations, and emotions can be imperceptibly shaped by physical and social elements as subtle as the temperature or lighting of this room, the texture of the clothes on our skin, or perhaps the path of someone who sat down just before us, um, well, we might be closer to the truth about what human psychology really is, uh, and maybe even about uh, questions of things like free will or what it means to be human. Um, so please. Uh, without further ado, please join me in welcoming a man whose ideas may literally rock your world, uh, author of Before You Know It, The Unconscious Reasons We Do What We Do, Dr. John Barch. I need a drink. <laughs> Those are two hard acts to follow. I don't know if I can. Uh, thank you very, very much. Uh, and thank you all for coming. This is easily the largest crowd I've had on this whirlwind tour of the West Coast, and I really appreciate your hanging in there. I hope you can see it. Um, these are my cues, the cues that tell me what to say, so I need them very desperately, um, and I can sort of see them. Uh, I'll tell you what the book is about to begin with. I uh, hope you can, you can't really read this, but uh, this is not Freud's unconscious, to start with. Uh, this is, for the first time in history, we have 30 or 40 years of research on average normal people uh, to look at what exactly consciousness is is there for. Why do we have it? Back when I started in the 1970s, the answer was for everything. We intended everything we did. We were aware of every influence on us. Everything was conscious. And okay, that's the way I was trained. That's why we all believed back in the 70s. But it was an untested assumption. 
didn't really tell us much about why we have consciousness, right? For everything, all right. But, you know, maybe it was for some specific kinds of purposes. And I think today, after 40 years, we know much more about what those specific purposes are and why we have it compared to it does everything. Because it doesn't, it's not needed to do everything. What I started to do was to look to see what could be done without it. And my method of subtraction to see what's left that couldn't be done unconsciously, and so therefore you need consciousness for it. One big uh, 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 spoiler alert here is that one big answer here is planning for the future. Another is to talk and communicate with other people. Those are things that we really can't do in advance because we don't know the contents of other people's minds until we meet them. So we can't be prepared and have it all wired in to begin with. That's impossible. <coughs> so there are things that consciousness really specializes in. It gives us a huge advantage uh, over other animals. Uh, we communicate, we pass along knowledge to our, ch to our children and they to their children, and we don't have to reinvent the wheel every generation as compared to all the other animals. And that's sort of the answer to the question, but I'm gonna tell you what we found out along the way and what it says about the way our mind works. Now I really can't see what I'm, okay. <laughs> so I, I organized this in terms of three questions. The book is organized in three parts. The hidden past, the hidden present, and the hidden future. The hidden past, as we'll start with, with some examples, has to do with your, your, your evolved, uh, basic, uh, very important needs for, and drives, for example, for physical survival, for, di for uh, avoiding disease, and, there's a little button there, uh, and uh, also your, your own personal past, uh, your, when you were an infant and toddler, you have no memory for those three or four years of your life, and lots happened that really isn't important for how your life goes the rest of the time, and, and research is showing that measurements taken of children, how attached they were to their mother at age one, predicts things like how many friends they have in grade school and high school and how many relationship breakups they have in their 20s. And they're following these people. That's measured at age one. So things you have no idea of what happened back then, so we have no memories for them. That's also part of our hidden past. And we'll move then to the things that happen in the present, how we go beyond what's in, uh, the information that's in front of us in very important ways, and then the future. And that's uh, the basic idea. I just said this is not Freud, because Freud uh, based his uh, theory, uh, which wasn't really, wasn't really subjected to much scientific tests, but based his theory on mental patients, on case studies of his mentally ill patients. Uh, at the same time, Pierre Genet, who was doing the same kind of work on the medicalization of mental illness for the first time uh, in Paris, as Freud was working in Vienna, disagreed strongly with Freud that you could generalize to all of human nature and all people around the world based on these abnormal, uh, ill people. But Freud said no, and Freud's viewpoint, as we all know, won the day. The research I'm going to tell you about is based on just average people assigned to, to randomly to conditions and, and done uh, uh, experimentally, uh, and, and that's the evidence we have now that we've never had before. One thing that this research is showing is that we just have one mind. We don't have two. We don't have a separate locked box unconscious. It's a separate uh, part of the mind that operates by different rules that we don't have access to. I don't know if you remember the movie Inside Out, you know, with the little emotions running the control room of the brain, right? A little bad emotion does something, gets thrown into the unconscious, and they lock the door, <laughs> and you never see them again, right? That's not what we're talking about. The unconscious is adaptive. It uses the same brain regions, the same systems, as when the same thing is done consciously. It's the same brain, the same specialized regions and circuits and so forth. This is a nice study from the University of College of London, a neuroscience study of, of reward, uh, rewards of a pound or a penny for exerting effort on a task. The reward cues are presented subliminally, so the person is not aware that they're there at all, or, or consciously. It didn't matter. When it was presented, and it was a pound, subliminally or superliminally, consciously, didn't matter, it increased performance. Even when the person couldn't see that it was a pound or a penny, it still increased performance, and the same brain region of the reward center of the brain lights up, becomes active in both cases. The same part of the brain responsible for detecting reward worked in both cases and drove behavior in both cases. So it's not a separate mind, it's the same mind. It can be run consciously, it can be run unconsciously, and the same kinds of functions. So single mind, adaptive, survive natural selection, it does, it's in our favor, it does things for us, it's on our side, it's not fighting us and doing destructive things. So that's a very different view than a lot of people have about the, the scary unconscious of Freud. The mind's in all three time zones at the same time, past, present, and future. Influences of the past, your, your childhood past, your recent past, your evolutionary past, don't have access to it. 
The future, your goals, your motivations, your aspirations, color how we see the present. Because the goal determines what we like and not, and the risks we're willing to take in service of that goal. The goal, what's good for the goal is good for us, and good, <laughs> we have to be careful what we wish for because it's the active goal that derives our, our, our decisions and our, our desires and our likes and dislikes. And as those goals change, so do our likes and dislikes. And what we think is healthy and what we think is risky and that kind of thing. But we're focused on the present. So we're going to understand what the reasons for what we're doing and the reasons for how we feel and the reasons for our decisions in terms of what is right in front of us at the time, that what's available to our conscious awareness. We're not going to uh, know about these other influences. So we're locked in the present. That's what we think is going on when all these other things are really influencing us. So we can misunderstand the real reasons for what we're doing and thinking and feeling. And that's what the book's about. So we'll start with the past. Okay, this is the evolutionary past. And basically we have... Uh, some, uh, we all know, obviously, we very important motivations to be physically safe, to survive, to not get harmed, to live, and to avoid disease, and some other ones too. I'm going to focus on the physical safety one. Because you'll be surprised at what that, what that influences that we think are reasoned, abstract kinds of, uh, of judgments we're, we're making. But it underlies a lot. So, for example, we hear a lot about immigration these days, and we hear a lot about uh, deportation, and we hear a lot about building walls. And this is a, a metaphor that's been used by arch-conservative leaders in the past, uh, one notably being Adolf Hitler, that likened uh, despised outgroups in the society as bacteria, as bac bacillum, that had to be eradicated because it diseased the body. And to cure the body, they had to be uh, eliminated, expurgated, and, and, and kicked out of the body and protected from coming back in. This metaphor is very powerful because it, it speaks to this very important need we all have and drive we all have to be physically safe and to avoid disease. But I don't think very many people are aware of it. So what we do here, show how the, uh, the, the attitudes towards immigration are related to this uh, desire to avoid and drive to avoid disease in the following way. We raise the threat of the flu. Right now people are being told, we're all being told to take flu shots, right? It happens October every year. There's a big threat of the flu, get your flu shot. We raise the threat of the flu to our participants in our study. Then we have them fill out attitudes towards immigration as part of the study we question we wanted them to do. Then afterwards we ask them if they had already gotten the flu shot or not. If we raise the threat of the flu and they had gotten the flu shot, they felt safe from the flu. They felt physically safe from the flu. Their attitudes towards immigration became markedly more positive. If, on the other hand, they had not yet had the flu shot and we raised the threat of the flu, their attitudes towards immigration became markedly more negative. We were moving around their attitudes towards immigration by raising the threat of the flu virus and having them have more positive or negative opinions about immigration. Immigrants into the culture being like germs into the body. And that's the metaphor, and it's a very powerful one and is being used today. In general, in general, conservatives, politically conservative people, let's say Republicans as a proxy in our country, uh, are more concerned with physical safety than, than Democrats or liberals. I want to be clear, physical safety is important. It's a very reasonable, important, uh, basic motivation we all have. There's nothing wrong with being concerned about physical safety, because that's, what, that's how we survive. And now we survived over the eons and, and millions of years. If it turns out that Conservatives are more concerned with it, have more of a concern with it than, than uh, liberals or Democrats. So, for example, you hear Franklin Roosevelt say, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. And you hear ex-president or former President Obama uh, worry about the politics of fear, because there really are politics of fear. There's a lot of research in the past that has actually shown you can take liberals and make them conservatives by threatening them, by making them feel afraid. That changes their attitudes to be more liberal. A lot of experiments have been done showing conservatives are more concerned with fear and, and physical, uh, physical safety. Uh, for example, conservatives actually have larger amygdala regions of their brain, which is what is, pro which is used to process uh, the emotion of fear. It's actually larger in brain imaging in conservatives and liberals, and lots of other studies showing this kind of thing. People have turned liberals into conservatives, but no one has ever turned a conservative into a liberal until we did it. And how do we do it? How would you think? Well, make them feel physically safe. And no one's ever done that, so what we did 
was to have them uh, engage in a, a rich imagination exercise where they had a genie that appeared to them and gave them a superpower. Now the superpower was either to fly, that was a control condition, Every actually that's the one we all prefer. Most people, if they were given a choice, want to be able to fly. So that's a good one. You can imagine yourself being able to fly. Great. You richly imagine that. But the condition we were really concerned with is the superpower to be, phys to be immune from physical harm. Nothing bad will happen to you. Bullets would bounce off you like Superman. If you fall off a building, you bounce. Nothing would cut you. You're immune from physical harm. And you imagine having that. Then we have people take the standard kinds of social attitude questions that usually differentiate conservatives and liberals, Republicans and Democrats, like same-sex marriage, marijuana legalization, you, you know, the, the classic ones that, that always do that. So as it turns out, people in the fly condition, they're in the left, you get the standard difference. Uh, the conservatives are more conservative on these issues than the Democrats. The fly, didn't, the fly imagination didn't do a thing. But the immunity from physical harm made the conservatives much more like the Democrats. It moved their... Uh, sorry, liberals, it, it moved their attitudes to be more liberal. And on a, another experiment, the, the, the defining uh, quality of, of, cons of being a conservative is resistance to social change. That's what Franklin Roosevelt was talking about because he was trying to get this new deal passed and he was telling people, don't be afraid of change. Mm -hmm. So what happens with resistance to social change after you imagine yourself being physically, uh, physically totally safe? There's now no difference between liberals and Democrats. They're on the left in the uh, immun immunity from t uh, physical harm. Now conservatives have moved to be having the same uh, attitude towards, towards social change as liberals and Democrats. So we, for the first time, this is temporary, <laughs> right? It's not a magic trick that has changed them forever, but temporarily, once they're in that state of feeling physically safe, it moves their political attitudes. You're, you're basically you're basically turning up and down the flame underneath a pot of boiling water. By making people feel afraid or safe underneath, you change their attitudes at the top. And that's the importance of these evolved, deep motivations from the past. They actually influence a lot more in your life than just trying to be safe and avoid actual disease. Changes political attitudes, attitudes towards immigration as, immigration as well. And that's that metaphor of a tree with roots. The roots affect the branches and the leaves on the top. Uh, we're moving to another one called physical warmth and coldness, and this is another line of research for the last 10 years that actually also shows that physical sensations such as feeling physically warm and cold actually cause you to feel warm or cold towards other people in the social sense. Warm being, you know, generous and, and trusting and, and uh, pro-social, and cold being betraying their trust and not having an interest at heart and, and being sort of, you know, I could care less what happens to you. And we use these words, we've used them forever. <coughs> there may be a reason why we use these words, warm and cold, instead of friend or foe or some other kind of word. The first study we ever did, we had people briefly hold a cup of hot coffee or a cup of iced coffee, just because we were trying to get their papers for them, and oh, we had a cup of iced or hot coffee in our hand. Here, hold that for a second while I get your papers. Take it back. Thank you very much. Just very brief incidental. They didn't think it was part of the experiment at all. And yet, if they had just briefly held the warm coffee, they formed a more positive impression of the person they read about than if they had just... Uh, held the, the iced coffee. Everyone read the same description of the same person. The only thing different was did they just briefly hold the hot coffee or the iced coffee for a second or two. They thought the person was warmer or they thought the person was colder. Imaging down at UCLA, neural imaging has now confirmed that this link does exist. The same area of the human brain, insula, the insula is a walnut shaped part of the brain right in the middle, becomes active. The same little part becomes active both when you hold something warm and when you're texting to your family and friends. The same little part. It's connected. There's a connection there between physical warmth and social warmth, and also between physical coldness and social coldness. It actually turns out that after people are rejected, uh, if they weren't included by a group uh, to, to do something like, you know, recess if you're not called, not uh, called to be a member of a team and you're rejected or you're not included, your body temperature actually decreases you actually have a decrease in your body temperature. If you're included, your body temperature actually increases slightly. And studies at UCLA, UCLA have actually tracked people on a day at the hospital. Every, every hour they take their physical temperature, they take their body temperature, and they also ask uh, the, the same people to rate how close they feel to their family and friends. And it goes up and down with their body temperature. The warmer their body temperature, the closer they feel to their family and friends. This has been pretty well established now, uh, ever since our coffee study of 10 years ago. I'll get a little more into that. 
because that's a life hack that I want to, I want to tell to all the parents and future parents out here because I think it really is very, very important um, when you have an infant uh, and a, a toddler uh, to give them that physical warmth uh, with hugs and so forth. And uh, even fathers should do that. Uh, maybe especially fathers should do that. But your, your personal past of those years that you don't remember from early childhood, and we don't. We don't have much memory for them. This is my little girl. When she was uh, two years old, she loved uh, Lightning McQueen. Her favorite movie was Cars. She had a Lightning McQueen car, a Lightning McQueen chair, a Lightning McQueen blanket. She even thought Lightning McQueen lived in the town next to us, Durham, Connecticut, because she saw a red Corvette every day and would squeal lightning from the car seat in the back. So she was a big Lightning McQueen fan and, and had all the accoutrement. Uh, and then when uh, we watched that movie 50 or 60 times, she just had to, had to see that movie over and over. Later, you know, when she was five, uh, uh, she wanted to watch a movie, and I, I saw, oh, it was Cars. We haven't seen that for a while. Let's, let's see Cars. You like that one. She said, what are you talking about? I said, you know, Cars. It, 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 you know, and she said, no, I don't know. And she had, had no memory of ever seeing it before. She's telling me this as she's sitting in the Lightning McQueen uh, chair. <laughs> <laughs> and she and she watched it, and, I, and, I, and she saw it for the first time. She she was surprised at all the plot twists. She was laughing at the right places. I mean, just, not like a person who's seen it fifty or sixty times. And, and I, I'm sure all all parents here know that feeling when you've had a shared history, a shared experience, you know, of years with your your little one, and then they have no memory of it. You do, but they don't. That what that's saying is. All these things that happened to her and all of us in those early years of life, we don't remember. We can't, we can't remember and feel like, oh, this is the reason I'm feeling the way I do today because of what happened when I was, you know, two, two, one, two or three years old. Or, you know, that's the reason I'm having this issue or that's whatever. We can't do that because we have no memory for it. And that's what gets back to this warmth thing. Because attachment at age one, as I explained before, does predict your relationship success the rest of your life. Not not determine it completely, but it does show an influence that how attached you were to your, your parent at age one does matter. And this channel that's there that, that, that senses, the infant senses, the toddler senses, physical warmth means trust. Physical warmth from someone means uh, they, they have your back, they have your interest, they have your, they're watching out for you. And it's a primitive, old signal but it should be exploited by us. In fact, now, uh, my wife actually uh, used to work at a hospital, and she says now they actually have the fathers open up their shirt and have the baby on their chest so they can also feel that uh, the contact, like, like with mothers and breastfeeding. The fathers do that too, and they say, oh, it's a skin-on-skin -skin contact that's important. It might be partly that, but it's also the warmth of the body because that is a channel that's there for the infant who doesn't know anything else. That's a signal that says, I can trust you, and it's very important in bonding. And it should be used and, and not laughed at like, oh, that's silly. Because our evolutionary past put that there for good reason. And it really does show in all the neuroscience, there's a hardwired link in our brain between those two things, a physical warmth and social warmth. The present, we, we go beyond what's uh, happening in the world all the time. For example, there's old man Marley, right, from Home Alone. And there's Grumpy Cat. Now, let me tell you something. Grumpy Cat is a cat. Grumpy Cat is not grumpy. I don't care how grumpy Grumpy Cat looks, Grumpy Cat is not grumpy. How do you know Grumpy Cat is right? Oh, because he looks right. What? She looks right. Well, just because she, the problem is we read faces as if we're so sure we know that person and that personality. Old man Marley, oh, he, a mass murderer, had chopped up bodies in the basement next door, right? No. He was a sweet old guy. Remember the scene at the end with the church and Christmas and reuniting with his granddaughter? You know, all that. I mean, we misread people from their faces all the time. We really think we know them just based on their faces, and we're, and we're almost always wrong because it's not diagnostic, and yet we're so sure we know somebody just, be, just because of their face. And that's a problem. Now, we're really good, though, if we see a person in action. So about trusting your gut, don't trust your gut just on a face or a photograph, but if you see a person in action interacting with somebody else, we're really good at judging them from that. That actually is pretty accurate but we have to see them in action. Think about evolutionary time. We didn't have photographs. We did see people in action. We saw them dynamically doing and acting in their face expressions when they're with somebody else and what they did. So as far as trusting your gut, which is another chapter in, in Before You Know It, trust your gut if you see a person in action. 
But don't trust your gut when you just have their face or just have a photograph because we're really misled by that. Okay, what you see is what you do. There's schools of fish, herds of antelope, flocks of birds. I don't know if you can see it. <laughs> I'm skeptical about this one, man. I've got three cats. They could care less what other cats or anybody else is doing. This, is a, this may not be true, this cat one. But it's definitely true of people, of us. Infants mimic like crazy, imitate their brothers and sisters, their adults around them like crazy. They're soaking up from those around them what to do, what, what's right to do, and the things they do, they're learning. And they really want to imitate and they really uh, mimic constantly, all the time. Now, we study that in people, in college students and adults, and uh, found a couple of things. One is that we all do it. If a person just happens to be somebody who's doing one kind of physical thing, like tugging at their ear, they do it more. Move to a different person who's not tugging their ear but shaking their foot, they stop tugging their ear and they start shaking their foot. They don't have any knowledge they're doing it, they're not aware they're doing it, we have to show them the videotape afterwards to prove that they really did do it, because they have no memory of this experience. This is something you do very naturally. And the other thing that you get out of this is, is pretty nice, I'll tell you in a second because I've got the slides coming up, um, is bonding. It's a natural way to bond between two people when there's this natural imitation going on. And there's some field studies showing how important that is in actual department stores and restaurants and, and field settings. But this is really important for society because behavior is contagious. Social disorder spreads. People who are, uh, uh, you can't really see this very well, it's a Dutch study, but on the street on the left there's no graffiti. It's all been painted over, there's no graffiti. They put uh, pamphlets on the, uh, the handles of bicycles with rubber bands and they look to see how much littering happened. On the left, not much at all. On the right, where there was a lot of graffiti, there was a lot more littering. So the idea is that you see the social, dis you see the social disobedience or the civil disobedience, the, the disorder on the, on the right, and it's a cue that then you do the same thing, and there's much more antisocial behavior in the form of littering uh, on the right. And this has been replicated in a bunch of different settings in field studies in, in Holland. Uh, this is a social network analysis. Things spread through social networks, things like obesity, cooperation, happiness, depression, are all more likely if you are one, two, three steps away from somebody who has those characteristics. In, in large social networks such as uh, uh, credit union members or alumni associations, that kind of thing. So even a person you don't even know but happens to know somebody that you do know and even three or four steps removed, you're more likely to have characteristics of them. Those things spread through the network. Uh, and that's social network analysis. Can't read this, but there's a Facebook study, 700,000 Facebook users, when they deliberately manipulated your news feed in 2014 to make it 20% more positive than usual, or 20% more negative than usual. The way they did that was by uh, coding how positive or negative the mood was of the different uh, uh, feeds, uh, different posts that they could show you in your feed, and then manipulated that as to randomly assign people to different conditions, and then looked at your own mood as measured by your own posts and, uh, and uh, what you wrote on Facebook for the next three or four days. And up to three and four days later, your own posts were more positive if they had exposed you to more positive uh, 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 posts in your newsfeed and more negative if it was the other way around with negative. So it spread through this network of 700,000 people. Uh, so you gotta be careful who your Facebook friends are. You know, a lot of us, we just let everybody who asks, yeah, you can be my friend, don't even know who they are. But you're exposing yourself to contagion from all these people uh, if you read uh, the posts that they, that they produce. Uh, and you're putting yourself at, at some risk. I mean, maybe if it's good, fine, but it, it doesn't have to be good. And what you see is, what you do is unfortunately used by advertisers a lot. And it's an effect that makes us, causes us to behave in certain ways. We've done studies showing that if you put a food ad in a little comedy clip in the lab and give people a bowl of goldfish crackers to eat out of, there's a food ad in that five-minute comedy clip, they eat many more goldfish crackers than if there's not a food ad in that, in that five-minute clip. So t TV food ads cause people to eat more at home. Unfortunately, it also causes preteens to drink more. Not preteens, not pre but pre-legal. These are 13 to 19-year-old uh, uh, adolescents, so they're teenagers, but they're not old enough to legally drink. If they do have a drink or so a month, uh, these are teenage drinkers, the more t TV alcohol ads that they see, the more they drink. And the people who see them, the most ads, and these are on commonly on like the NFL games in the afternoon on Sunday, right? I mean, there's a lot of alcohol ads and you can watch football games, sports, and other things with your kids, and they're seeing these ads. 
If they see a bunch of ads, they can drink 30 drinks a month compared to the same group without seeing ads who drink 10 drinks a month. So this really does impact on our kids, on teenagers, and it's something to watch out for because we just don't have the control over this effect of ads on our behavior that we think we do. And this is the bonding thing. This is nice. So, so if someone imitates you and you imitate them back, you sort of bond together. You like each other more. We found that. Turns out that people who are naturally empathic score high on empathy scales and personality scales are those who pay more attention to the other person. And by just merely paying more attention to the other person, you're more naturally seeing what they're doing and it'll cause you to imitate and so forth and, and have this wonderful cycle established totally unconsciously without even trying. <coughs> If a waitress, this is a study in Holland, repeats back the customer's order, just repeats back exactly what they said, instead of just writing down saying, uh-huh, their tips are significantly higher at the end. This is a French department store. You can't possibly read this. But in a French department store, the electronic section selling MP3 players, the clerks either repeated back what the customer said as far as the reasons why they wanted, like, oh, I'd like to get an MP3 player for my grandson. He's turning 13 next week. Oh, you'd like to buy an MP3 player for your grandson. He's going to be 13 next week. <laughs> Sounds weird. But if they did that, the sales went from 63% of, of encounters with sales clerks, 63% to 87%. And the customer satisfaction as measured out in the parking lot by somebody else later was significantly higher. So this actually works. Imitating mimicry creates bonding, creates liking, facilitates the interaction, and makes for more pleasant uh, feelings all around. Another type of present uh, influence, the last one I'll talk about, uh, is uh, that you can be a different person in your different social, con in different contexts, like home versus the office. You can be a different person, different personality, and have different values and behave differently too, as shown by this classic example. <laughs> <laughs> my sister and my niece are here. This isn't like our mom, is it? No, no, not at all. <laughs> right? Okay. So there have actually been studies. Uh, uh, Ernst Fair, who's a behavioral economist at the University of Zurich, he does, he does work with, he studies investment bankers. And he wanted to see what uh, the effect of the context that the banker was in on terms of their dishonesty and their greed. And what he did was, he got them all at home on a Saturday. So they're at home, right? They're all at home when they, ha when they do the study. And he has them play a game where they flip coins. And they, they, the only one they know if they get heads or not, and they report back how many heads they get out of 10 uh, tosses. For each head, they get 20 Swiss francs. If you get 10, yeah, you get 10, you get 200 Swiss francs, right? And you're, you're the only one, you're flipping, you're just telling them what you got, right? For some of the people, he had them uh, first write down a description of what their office environment looked like in terms of the desks, the layout. They had to think about the workplace or not. And these are the same people randomly assigned to those two conditions, right? You can't really see this, but the, the graph on the left shows the people when they were at home and they had not thought about their office. And that distribution pretty much follows the chance distribution, what you'd expect just by chance. There would be some people who get a lot of heads and some people who get very few heads, and this, the average is going to be sort of in the middle. And actually, that is what happened with their self-reports. They're actually very honest. There were actually some people who said they only got one or two. There are a few people who got a little more, but you know, not more than what you expect just from chance. But on the on the right, these are the people who had just thought about their, their office. It shifts way to the right. Now you got this guy, look at the lucky guy all the way in the on the right there. Oh, lucky me, I got ten heads. Like, sure, buddy. Lucky you, right. But they're all shifted that way. So there was a general tendency to oath to report more than would be expected by chance. The same people, right? They're not dishonest individuals. They're honest at home, they're honest unless you remind them of their workplace. And then there's a different moral standard, a different greediness, and a different uh, um, acceptable behavior. Unfortunately, this affects kids too. Asian American girls, five years old, Harvard study, 10 years ago, doing a math test. If they just colored in uh, cartoons, little colorings, of uh, featuring Asian identity themes, versus they had just colored in uh, coloring things with girls playing with dolls. So they either emphasize their Asian aspect of their identity or their female aspect of their identity. Okay, randomly assigned, if they had colored in the Asian themed cartoon things, they score significantly higher than average on the math test compared to a control condition. If they, they color in the girl one, they score significantly lower 
than average. And these are the same girls. If their Asian identity has been activated, it's been made salient through this coloring, they do better than average. If the female one, they've already got the cultural stereotypes. They're five years old. When this study came out, I mean, it was announced in a, a conference, there was an audible gasp in the audience because we all thought, if we can just get to girls in first grade, you know, and start telling them, you can do math, you can do science, you know, forget this belief that teacher, if we can just get them in school, but it's too late almost by then because they're five years old, it's already in the culture, it's already in their head to the point where you can influence their behavior by making one aspect of their identity salient or not. And of course, they're totally unconscious of this kind of a fact. They have no idea what, what the coloring had anything to do with their math at five years of age. Now we move to the future. The future basically is your goals and your motivations, and they influence what you think are good and bad things. They influence who you think your best friends are. They influence a lot of things. Now, I play too much of this game called Candy Crush. <laughs> now, I don't know about you, but you know, you're know you doing this level, you're doing it for weeks, you just can't get past this stupid level, and you're so close. you got like one thing to go or whatever it is, and it says, oh, in-app purchase, extra moves, $5. You know, like, don't you want the extra moves? Like, yes, 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 extra moves. And you beat the level, hey, you beat the level. And so, oh, because the goal says, yes, yes, yes. The goal says to beat this level. The goal says, yes, 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 get the extra moves. And then you get the bill. Apple iTunes, Apple iTunes, Apple iTunes, Apple iTunes, right? $4.99, $4.99, $9.99, $9.99. And I'm like, what was I doing? It's a stupid game on my phone. No one cares. No one knows. Why do I care so much? You care so much because when you're in that mode and you've got that goal, you really want to win that level, you'll do it. You'll buy the extra moves and spend the money. When it's at, you know, after the fact, like, am I an idiot? I so delete this stupid app, right? And they give it to you for free, right? Because they depend on these in-app purchases. They depend on, they know motivation. They know the effects of goals on people. They're very smart that way. These are uh, obese people or non-obese people in a Dutch grocery store. When they come in, they're given a recipe flyer. The recipe flyer either has words about dieting and healthy eating, or it doesn't. Then they go and shop, fine. They come back, they, they say, thank you, can we, we see your receipt? And they looked on the receipt to see how many snack purchases, unhealthy snack purchases a person made. If they were not obese and did not have a dietary goal operator, and that, that there was no effect of that, diet, of that, of that uh, recipe flyer, but for the obese people who presumably are more likely to have a goal for healthy eating and, and, and avoiding uh, unhealthy snacks, if they had seen those diet and health words in that recipe flyer, they uh, bought significantly less um, of uh, unhealthy snacks, like uh, 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 180 uh, euros instead of 4 and 20 euros uh, on the average. So they had no memory of what was on that recipe flyer. They denied, of course, that this had any effect on them. What it did was to activate their goal of, of healthy eating and dieting, and it really did help them reduce their uh, snack purchases in the store. And if you don't buy it, you don't have it at home, you can't eat it. Same thing with tanning salons and diet pills. These are University of Minnesota uh, women who, who say these are unhealthy things. They would never do them. They would never take diet pills. It's, it's dangerous. They would never use tanning salons. They might get skin cancer, so they don't do these things. But if you have them look at Tinder or look at some dating site and just rate how attractive the people are on these, on these uh, pictures on these sites as part of some study and then ask the same question, suddenly, because you've activated this, Reproduction, very deep, important goal. Reproduction, mating, finding a partner. Uh, being attractive is, is very good. The goal says, yeah, you want to be attractive. And the, the goal says, you want to be attractive, and says, yeah, these things aren't so dangerous. They rated them as less dangerous. They rated them more positively. They were said, I'm more likely to go to a tanning salon now. I'm more likely when this goal was activated. It changed what they thought was healthy. It also had them say that it's less risky. They actually said the risk of these things is lower than the other condition that hadn't just looked at these photographs uh, the, on the dating site. So the goal changes their health risk, the goal changes their um, feelings about these unhealthy kinds of behaviors. The book ends in a couple of ways. Uh, the unconscious never sleeps is basically the idea that when you have an important thing you're thinking about, you're, unconsciously, you can be working on that problem and it can be uh, being solved for you or worked on in the background. Uh, you, you can give yourself um, a problem to work on that you're going to work on later. And actually, it can be worked on while you're doing something else entirely. Like when you're trying to remember something, right? And you can't, and you just can't, and you know you know it, and you can't remember it. Uh, but then like three or four hours later, the answer pops into your head when you're doing something else. 
Well, why did it pop in your head suddenly when you're doing something else? Because it was continued to be worked on in the background, trying to solve that problem. When the answer was available, you got it. Sherlock Holmes did this all the time. When he, when he had a difficult case and he couldn't figure it out, he would go do something else for a while to refresh, he said, to refresh his, his mind. He'd go play the violin or take cocaine or whatever Sherlock Holmes did. <laughs> and he'd come back and he'd, he'd have some answer. And he said, oh, Watson, this really refreshes the mind. It really didn't refresh the mind so much as it let unconscious problem solving work on it while the conscious attention was somewhere else, which is a really good idea and a really good way to solve problems that you're working on. Sometimes the answers will come to you, like it did for Archimedes, who said Eureka in a public bath and actually ran naked through the streets of Syracuse. He didn't have a towel on. This is the G-rated version of Archimedes. <laughs> they didn't have bath towels and things like that. But he had the answer when he was doing something completely different. It was a problem he worked on for a long time. And sometimes there's, there's famous cases where scientists have had answers to questions come to them, appear to them in dreams like Kekulé's benzene ring theory, where he worked on this and couldn't figure it out. No one could figure it out. It was a very important problem in chemistry. He couldn't figure it out. He was dozing in front of the fire, and then suddenly a vision appeared in a dream of snakes in a circle eating each other's tails, and they were on fire. A fiery ring of snakes. Ah, that's it. It's a circular structure. It's not this other, you know, normal kinds of uh, molecular structure. It's a circle you're a circular structure. The alligator is my dream. Now, if we have Q and A, and I can explain, it takes a little bit of explanation. But I had this dream, and an alligator appeared to me, and the alligator gave me the answer to something I've been working on for ten years, and I had this experience, and it's where the book started because I didn't understand everything until this alligator told me the key. And I, I remember the uh, somebody's advice once was, "Don't write something until you understand it." So I, I didn't want to start writing any kind of books. I didn't understand it. I didn't understand what was going on. The alligator dream revealed it to me, and it was an incredible experience. A very short little dream, but the alligator is my version of the benzene ring and the, the fiery snakes. So people have worried a little bit about um, uh, having their minds controlled. Uh, you know, with all these kinds of influences operating on people, um, you know, it's legitimate to worry about whether, uh, you know, somebody's out there like me, you know, I'm flashing stuff and making you do things like, <laughs> I would never do that. <laughs> no one would ever do that. But you know, it's a legitimate thing to worry about. Um, and so, yeah, okay, well, <laughs> I'm pushing it for all it's worth here. So, uh, so it's it's something that it's legitimate to, to worry about. And you know, the Economist magazine has worried about this in the past. And. Uh, worrying about uh, chemical mind control and other kinds of influences that I'm talking about. But th really, um, well, this is historic, too, because uh, this book was from the 1970s. Communism, hypnotism, and the Beatles. The Beatles were hypnotizing us with their beat and uh, you know, brainwashing us uh, to be communists, which why the Beatles would care, I don't know. Um, this is uh, something you can buy on eBay called an aluminum foil beanie that actually deflects uh, beams from outer space aliens trying to control your mind. Uh, and of course, there's always been sex and ice cubes uh, to help uh, sell things, and that's that's a classic subliminal kind of ad. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember this. this is my last example, but this actually happened. This is the 2000 uh, Bush 43 versus Al Gore campaign in September 2000. There was an actual subliminal ad that emphasized rats right before the word Democrats appeared to emphasize the rats and Democrats like association, right? And, and George W. at the time denied that this was intentional and denied, he said, we don't do any subliminal advertising. Uh, and he kept denying the subliminal advertising for the next week or so, which was lots of fun. But they did try it. People said, there's no way this happened accidentally. You know, it's, it's, so they look at these things uh, slide by, uh, screen by screen. But uh, that was the last attempt that I know of. The thing is, forget all that stuff. The, what you need to... I don't even say worry, but be concerned with as far as influences are those things I've just been talking about that are on the left. But a lot of people, we all feel we're the captain of our soul, we're the captain of our ship, the only thing that affects us are things we're aware of, and we intend to do everything we do, nothing else is happening at all. And yeah, okay, you know, but real, real good sea captains don't just aim their ship where they want to go and forget the fact that there's wind and there's current. They take the wind and the current into account and adjust for it and get where they want to go. Otherwise, this happens, which does happen to a lot of our lives. If you play golf, you know, you just aim right at the hole if there's a crosswind. You could, and then this happens. So, you know, you could do it that way, but the thing is, once you know about these things and these mechanisms, you can adjust for them, you can account for them, and you can do better. You can also use them to your advantage. There's a lot of 
Uh, once you know the mechanisms, there's a lot of ways you can take these and use them to your advantage. Um, so really, you don't have to worry about mind control because you've got it and no one else has it. And you know, all you have to do is know what's going on and then you can do what you want to do. Thank you very much. That'd be great. Yeah, 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 Golden Gators. Golden Gators. So my question is, uh, given everything that you've done and you've studied the research, do you think there's any reasonable argument left for the existence of free will? Oh, <laughs> yes, 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 thank you. Uh, you know, I have actually written uh, chapters in the past that said that the free will is, is uh, unnatural and doesn't exist. And the reason I wrote that is the philosophical definition of what free will is. It's not ours. It's not what we would say. But the philosophical definition is of a miraculous cause, external cause that's not caused by anything else, like supernatural almost, an, uh, an origin. And that's not true because conscious thoughts are causal. Obviously, if something bad happens to you, happens to me, what do I do? I think immediately to regulate my emotion, I think about other people who have it even worse off than me, right? I, I call, it's called downward social comparison. So I think about people who are even worse off and I feel, well, at least I'm not that bad off, I feel better. Mm -hmm. Or I transform what happened and it's not so bad, it'll be okay. I talk myself out of it. That has a real effect on my emotions. We all do it, right? We, we do that kind of work consciously and it is causal because it changes our emotions. It's not unconscious. It's very deliberate and conscious. If we don't want to exercise today, we can rationalize. That's conscious. That's deliberate thought. You know, I'm missing one day of exercise isn't so bad. Or, you know, one more piece of chocolate cake isn't so bad. I can rationalize it, and I can do the thing I really want to do, even if it's not you know, in my long-term interest. And that's causal, conscious thought. That's what psychologists were always concerned with. The behavior said consciousness didn't matter. They said conscious thought wasn't causal. And this is the big debate in psychology. But clearly it is, we all know it is, and the last chapter of Before You Know It is all about you have mind control and all about the power of your conscious mind to do what you want and to override some of these things or to set them up to your advantage and, and so forth. If you define free will as that your conscious thoughts are causal, yes, you have free will. And I think that's what we all think, that's what we want to know. You know, do, do what I think and what I plan and what goes on in my head, does that matter to my outcomes in my life? Yes. It does. And by our, the psychological definition, we have it. By the philosophical one, we don't, because it has to be this miraculous cause that's not caused by something else. And our conscious thoughts come from unconscious sources, comes from our goals and motives and our past. You know, there's a reason, there's a source for our, our conscious thoughts. They don't come from nowhere, right? So they're caused, they're not original causes, the philosophical definition. So it gets into sort of technicality, how you define free will. But I think. When I, when I really thought about it, what, what psychology has always been concerned with is the question of whether our conscious thoughts are causal and effective and change things. And there's overwhelming evidence that that's true. Thank you. And, um, I've been aware of studies like when women look at images in magazines and then rate themselves lower. So my question is about the diet pills and the tanning booth. When they were on Tinder, were they looking at pictures of potential mates or potential competitors? <laughs> It didn't matter. That is a very important, it's a very great question because in that study, they did have women looking at, they had heterosexual women looking at women or looking at men and either one. So they actually talked about that. They thought when they're looking at women, they're, they're looking at their competition. And they're looking at men, they're looking at their potential, exactly what you just said. And either one activates that, that goal and to be more attractive for either competitive purposes or for attraction purposes, right? But what you said earlier, I want to I get to that because it's in the book. This is a famous study by Barbara Fredrickson at the University of Michigan, where she had a consumer product testing kind of study. And as part of it, you, you tasted things and you looked at things. And one of it was to try on a pair of uh, a swimming suit. And then they did some things afterwards, like take a math test, the GMAT math test, the one you take to get into the um, MBA programs. And these are University of, women, uh, University of Michigan under, undergraduate women, right? They, they probably have a fairly strong academic identity, right? But if they try it on the swimsuit, they do worse on the math test. The image of, you know, of my, my, my value as a woman is to be attractive and have a nice body is not compatible with being smart and being, you know, uh, intelligent. And if they try on the swimsuit, now the men who try on the swimsuit doesn't, you know? It's like Pavlov's cat. Ding! Like, yeah? But, 
what? <laughs> but the women were affected, and, 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 a, and a group of women who have a strong academic identity fall for the same thing that everybody else falls for. I've never met you before in my life. Um, for the experiment you did with the hot and cold drinks, my question is, did you have any kind of control with like the season or how hot it was outside? Oh, this is great. This is great. No, no, no. You're getting into a whole big area of research. It's, it's, very, it's a very interesting area of research. But it was June, May and June, because that made the presence of iced coffee not surprising. If we had had an iced coffee, it might have alerted them there's something funny going on here in December. So this is outside uh, up for the Sterling, Li Sterling Library at Yale, the big uh, library at Yale. And it was uh, in May and June, the first study we did. But you're getting into something else. Like, for example, are people who live in warmer climates, are they warmer people, right? And I, when I first published this and was in science, I used to get all these angry emails from Sweden. <laughs> You know, like Sven is writing, he says, how can you say this about, you know, about warm and cold because we live in the coldest country, yet we're the warmest people. And I was like, yes, Sven. And I, I wrote back, and I, you know, sorry, his, his, I think his name was Sven, I'm sorry. But um, I, I wrote back and I said, oh, but Sven, you know, it's a, it's a contrast between when you come in from the cold into the warm house, it's much stronger effect in Sweden. Was, yes, that's must be it. <laughs> that must be why we're such warm people and all that. Stuff. But, you know, there's interesting research on that. And there was a, a study um, the farther people live from the equator, the colder their personality. So the closer you live to the equator, right? And this has now been a little, you know, well, it's more complicated than that. And so the person who wrote that is saying, I'm not sure about this anymore. So it's still ongoing, this idea of, of how your ambient temperature on the outside actually influences, you know, the, the pro-social, anti-social nature. It's still, it's still a, a sort of a, it's not a con controversial research area, but it's still ongoing. We really don't know the answers yet, but it's a great question. Yeah, on that topic, I belong to a cold water swimming club in the Bay. And we go in and it gets as cold as 48 in the winter. Wow. It's about 55 now. Wow. And it is one of the closest clubs that I've never yes. bonded with people more quickly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they have to do that. Part of it is you have to be a certain type of person to do that. So these are similar personalities. But I think it comes to when you come in after an hour in 55 degree water and get in the sauna, to warm up. Yeah, yeah there you go. There. There you go. <laughs> Sven would be very pleased with that. <laughs> yes, it must be. That's a great example. That's a great example. Yeah. Um, so recently I've, I've gone down a little bit of a rabbit hole of the satanic panic in the 1980s. Um, and then I recently watched the episode, the show The Keepers on Netflix. Mm -hmm. And the theme there is uh, repressed memories. And I was wondering what your opinion on the unconscious mind, because it was after the satanic panic of the 1980s, if you don't know, uh, a lot of that was based on repressed memories and accusations made, and then psychiatry kind of said, no, 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 all that's wrong, we're sorry, we're sorry. And then later we kind of walked that back now. Yeah. Uh, we think that actually that may be a thing. I was wondering your opinion. There's a really, I don't want to plug another book besides my own, which is, of course, the best book you should buy. But um, <laughs> there's a book called Remembering Satan. And it's uh, a, by a reporter about this case where a father confessed to abusing and doing something to his daughter that he had no memory of. But, but he was convinced it actually had to be true because everybody was telling it because the daughter had said this because her, her therapist had, had told her this must have happened. And so this whole trace and his father felt so horrible, didn't have a memory of doing it, but felt so horrible and everyone was saying he did it so he actually confessed and went to jail, went to prison and actually was finally let out because it turned out that it never did happen. And uh, it was a, a false memory implanted by the therapy process and this is the danger of this whole thing. And that's what the outcome that I know from inside psychology was the people in therapy are very vulnerable to being told what's going on with them and they trust the therapist and, and unfortunately at the time there were some therapists who really thought these things were going on they thought they were doing the right thing but they were misguided and they were putting false memories into people and then they were reporting them and saying they must have been true when they really didn't happen didn't have no actual memory themselves and actually this kind of thing has been studied and shown that that is how this thing operates so yeah see repressed memory is a Freudian concept of, of, a, of, of a defensive uh, reaction and there's not that much scientific evidence in favor of repression the one thing there's there's evidence for is projection and that's natural because if it's on your mind it's more likely that you will interpret somebody else's behavior because it's accessible in your own mind and so that projection actually does happen but that's the only one repression doesn't really seem to be um, much evidence for it and that's a legacy of Freud, yeah. Um, one question, um, are, are any of these experiments like the coffee one disproved? Because I just 
read something about the University of uh, Manchester or something that had done that disproved, and not disproved that it didn't happen, but that had questions whether that warm cold coffee had an effect. Well, we were doing these studies, uh, repeating a study that was done in 1946, which wasn't the best, most reliable measure, by a guy named Solomon Ash, who did the first impression formation study ever. And we repeated his study, which maybe not the best methods, but we repeated his study and had and substituted the words warm and cold with the actual experience of warm and cold. And, and it was a fairly crude little simple study just to demonstrate that originally. Now, that was like using a, 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 like the cover of the book, uh, a magnifying glass to look at something, and the, me the, the, the measurement was not as uh, fine and accurate. Now we have neuroscience, and neuroscience with its microscope compared to our magnifying glass is finding the actual link lighting up between warmth, of, of physical warmth and social warmth, and finding uh, you know, that uh, it, uh, your body temperature tracks with feelings of uh, warmth towards family and friends and all that. So using the even more powerful technique of, of uh, neural imaging, uh, when people are holding something warm or texting their family and friends, they've confirmed this link exists, which is what we said from our little magnifying glass experiment. So if they're going back and repeating and, and having trouble with the magnifying glass one, we've already gone past that. They're actually using physical warmth, heat, heat treatments, whole body treat, heat treatments in, uh, in hospitals to treat clinically depressed patients and showing improvements over a two-week period that lasts for two weeks after that treatment. So it's already being used in therapy, too. So we sort of moved past that. You know, people want to go back and, and repeat and see if they can find original things with crude measurement. The crudeness of the measurement is going to be a problem with repeating, unfortunately. Although that has been replicated by a number of people. But, you know, going to the more modern methods with neuroscience, and that's confirming it. So, you know, if I want to tell you what the reality is, that's the reality. The neuroscience is showing it. Yeah, not just the neuroscience, but linguistics. George Lake also work on metaphors. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's actually a, a daily diary study that tracks people and how warm they think they are, their body are, and they, they track their behaviors, how many pro-social behaviors, warm behaviors they do or not, and it tracks uh, when you have a little app on your phone and people say, you know, how, how warm they feel separately from how many generous and trusting things they've done, and that just came out too. So there's lots more evidence that's much better, measure, much better measures, reliable measures than we used originally. I guess I'm wondering, has anybody written, or is it in your book, or are you going to write um, the kind of how-to guide that, that's the companion to this more scholarly work, which is, I don't know if that's being worked on you know, cognitive behavioral therapy, or, or on a societal level, or kind of, I mean, it kind of begs the question, okay, well, we know these things now, what can we as individuals and what can we as a society do next yeah. to counteract some of this and to make things go you know, the way we want? Yeah, that's actually in the book. I put it all in here. Yeah. It's actually, I'm sorry, it really is in the book. I mean, that was the point of the book, uh, to not just give the, the, the evidence, but to say, you know, what we can do personally and what maybe should be done. A lot of these things, unfortunately, are at the cultural level coming in, and there are things that well-intentioned people who are, you know, the stars of the most watched TV programs are still demonstrating and, and exhibiting these kinds of biases towards the, the African-American characters and their shows and things like that, and they don't, they don't know they're doing it. It's communicated to everybody, the millions of people who watch it, and news editors have the same kind of bias operating, and they don't mean to do it either. And so clearly, there's something that they can do that's pretty easy, because what their actions and decisions in their newsroom or on their TV studio affect millions and millions of people watching. Yeah. Is that a question? Oh, okay. So, so I was I was pretty much raising my little girl, um, you know, by myself, and uh, I was uh, 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 reading. It was a fall. It was actually October, and this was 11 years ago now. Uh, and uh, she was running around her playpen, and I was just totally exhausted because she never would take a nap. So I finally got her and put her in a crib, and just hoped to God she would take a nap. And I didn't even care. I walked in and fell right on the bed and fell asleep. And I had the alligator dream. And uh, the fall foliage was right outside the windows. I, I remember it all really well, and I didn't sleep for very long. So I immediately dropped into this dream and had this alligator dream. And the alligator dream was I was in the Everglades National Park, which I visited once before, and I was walking on one of those wooden walkways in the swamp, and there was an alligator you know, floating along next to me. And I was, okay. And as I walked, it was next to me, and it went a little ahead of me, got a little ahead, and then flipped over and looked at me. And that's when I woke up. Now, what does that mean, right? <laughs> But it was the answer to my question. Because all of this evidence for 10 or 15 years was showing that, that even infants and children were showing these kinds of unconscious effects. 
And the class, the model, even much of psychology has today, in my field anyway, was that you only get these kinds of effects through, it starts out conscious, and then you practice, practice, practice through a lot of experience, like driving or typing or any skill, it becomes sort of unconscious with a lot of, with a lot of practice and experience. Then how can these little kids show it? How can 18-month-olds show it? How can, can uh, you know, a five-year-old show it? And so forth and so on. And that evidence was coming in from developmental psychology. And other, other reasons, too. And there were the evolutionary psychologists, too, who were pointing to these kinds of evolutionary effects. But it didn't fit this standard model, conscious first, then it becomes unconscious with experience, right? The alligator flipping over was saying, flip it around. The unconscious came first. It was there throughout human history for millions of years before the advent of what we call consciousness. To have abstract thought and detach yourself from the world and to be able to have intentional control over these systems and plan for the future. All of that started with, you know, the time of the cave paintings, you know, what, what 100,000 years ago, which is a long time, but not in terms of the millions of years of, of human history, right? So all those things before that were done unconsciously. All these systems, the what you see is what you do, and the other ones in the book, that should I say or should I go, and the, uh, the survival needs, and, the, and the, all these things that, that uh, are evolutionary and, and uh, very adaptive, got us to that point. They were helpful, adaptive, they helped us survive, they gave us a survival advantage, and that's why they are there. And they were there first. And now the conscious system that we have makes use of those same old systems, and they influence each other. Once I put the unconscious first, which was that alligator is trying to tell me, flip the assumption, put the unconscious, everything fell into place. And that's when I really sort of thought about and started writing on the book, although I really could only write in the last three years when I started getting some more help at home and had the time to do it. <laughs> but, you know, until then, uh, I couldn't, because uh, she was a handful. Yeah. Yes? Is there any, uh, any, any, any school of thought that says everything is unconscious and the conscious just exists to make up stories about hmm. what your unconscious did. <laughs> yes, just yes. Just makes life interesting, but really you have no free will. You're there, operating as a stimulus response. There, well, there are people who... law physics, and then you just, you just explain everything to yourself after the fact. Yes, there is that. And I'll tell you, the person who, if you want to uh, look at that, is Michael Gazanica, uh, who's a... The, the, they call him the father of cognitive neuroscience, actually. <laughs> has an idea that, and he had uh, worked with split brain patients, these are people who have epileptic, epileptic seizures and they've cut the cor uh, corpus callosum to prevent the reverberation effect and cause these seizures, and so uh, they have a left brain and a right brain. He would present information to the right brain, the left brain wouldn't know about it, but it would cause people to do the things that he suggested, like get down on all, floor, all fours and walk like a dog, or leave the room, or do these things. And people would do them and immediately come up with a very uh, reasonable explanation for what they were doing. They thought that they meant to walk out of the room. Oh, I'm thirsty. I must get some water. Or I'm uh, lost an earring, and it's down here somewhere. You know, and they're crawling around on all fours. So his idea is that uh, we have these impulses to action, and we interpret them after the fact and make some reasonable theory about what's going on. Uh, even William James, who was the, the father of American psychology back in the 1890s, believed that that impulse to action came from your goals. It came from other things, and then what your conscious uh, mind did was to sort of uh, exert executive control over that, allowing some of those through and, and stopping other ones, sort of like a gatekeeper. But even your goals could be just made up, and you have no idea what the real goals of your unconscious are. Well, we can induce those goals in people, and we can show differences if they're, for example, they've gone without uh, smoking for four hours, and they have a really strong need for a cigarette. They show these effects that they can't possibly manage, these implicit effects on their attitudes, that they can't, manip they can't do it uh, on their own. It, it, it's a way to find out what their attitudes are separately from their, they can't control it. Uh, and if they're hungry, people do different things. Uh, if, they have, if we can induce goals in other ways, their, their behavior changes. Like, so what, the, what about these people with the diet uh, primes, like with the healthy and, uh, and diet um, words in the recipe flyers, and then they buy significantly less, and they have no idea why. I mean, they don't even have a, a conscious version of what they just did, yeah. right? So they're being induced outside of their awareness. Yeah. But it's a, it's a, you're making a strong case, and there are people who argue that. So I recently took some implicit association tests. Yes. And which we're going to have to explain to everybody here. But uh, but these seem to be persistent unconscious biases over time. And you've talked a lot about these um, uh, about unconscious uh, adjustments that are happening in the moment. What's the relative strength of these? 
Well, you know, there's some issue about that being reliable. There are some issues about that being a stable thing, the, the same person that scores the same way over time. Uh, and so that's the issue because it's being used by business and, um, and some places to uh, screen people to be hired if they show that bias or not. It's actually being used in business and industry and there's a big consulting um, lesion of people who are in that area. Um, it was actually, a, I don't know if you follow uh, Tumblr, but there was a, a, a question about implicit bias about two, fri two or three Fridays ago when they had these corporate experts in there. The implicit association test for everybody else is you can go to the uh, Project Implicit or Implicit at Harvard and you can actually get on the website and take these tests yourself. The test shows whether you have a positive or negative association to different social groups and that's all it does. Is do you have a positive association or negative association? Because if you do, that test can detect it in ways that you, you find difficult uh, to do a task when it's set up a certain way and easy when it's set up a different, uh, another way. And that reveals, the, the difference between those two reveals the extent of your uh, implicit uh, unconscious bias or implicit bias. But all that is is a, a positive or a negative association with the group, just good or bad. That's all it is, because the good or bad is, is all, all they're measuring. Not measuring content or the, the kinds of beliefs you have about the stereotype groups at all, just whether you have a positive or negative feeling. Those are the things that culture gives. Those are the things that are unfortunately present in all these popular TV shows or the news and so forth. They show these standard uh, television shows with well-intentioned people like Mark Harmon, David Caruso, and the TV show like Bones or Friday Night Lights or these very popular shows. And unfortunately, they can measure how much of that is going on in the show. And the more people watch it, the more negative their IAT scores are afterwards. So there are cultural influences. Um, from our media and, and from uh, just the belief of the general culture. Um, so when you score, if you score high on those kind of things and you show negative biases, remember that a lot of us do, uh, maybe the majority of us do in the culture, and that is a problem. So it's not an individual problem per se, but it's something that we've soaked up. And it, you know, again, uh, there's been studies on six and seven year olds who show the same kind of IAT scores as adults do now. So they're already getting it at age six or seven. So it is it, it's very much a cultural problem. And uh, 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 I think we don't have a, it's not a secret that we have that problem in this country. I'm curious about the uh, liquor ads. Yeah. And um, given that research, uh, do you think that there could be, a case could be made for um, the pharmacology epidemic we're having in this country and the fact that this is one of two countries in the entire planet? that lets pharmaceutical companies advertise on television? It's all you see. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I watch the things I watch. I mean, it's all there are, pharmaceutical ads. I mean. And they say stuff like, uh, you might sleep dry. Oh, yeah. yeah. This can kill you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You know, yeah, like, a side effect is death. <laughs> <laughs> That's all it is. You know, or vomiting and bleeding. <laughs> this is really fun to listen to this stuff. But you know, what they've shown is that people don't listen. They're just watching the visuals. And the visuals are the happy people who are dying and bleeding. You know, and it's like, oh, I'll take that. But you know, they, they have a lot of money, right? And that's why they, they have all the ads, because they have a lot of money to spend on ads. That people demand for. Yeah. Do you think a case could be made that that, that could be something we could Oh, I, I mean, that's absolutely a wonderful idea if you could actually do it, but they contribute to congressional races like crazy. I mean, I, I, you know, you know, it's the system, right? They took the cigarettes off. They took cigarettes off, yeah. It took yeah. Them a long time, though. They did it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we did that. That's good. We shouldn't give up. We took cigarettes, right? And look, you know, cigarette use has really dropped. It really has. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. like your stance. It does. Now there are more cigarettes smoking. Yeah, smoking pure. Oh, my God. <laughs> You guys are corrupting me. So anyway, it's a wonderful idea. I agree. And get these stupid Viagra, Viagra ads off of NASCAR races. I mean, it's embarrassing to me. My wife said, I mean, it's, it's embarrassing. It's all they show. You, yeah, anyway. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.